Welcome back. In this lecture, we will give an overview of how you should model time series. Basically, this will be the structure of the entire course. So we will go through all the steps. Basically, we cover the entire course in one lecture. We're going to th go through the steps saying what you do first, what you do next, and so forth, without, of course, any details. And then we'll come back to all the details later on. So what is it all about? Imagine that I gave you some kind of data. So this is the... Um, the, the, the temperature outside, the amount of power consumed, the number of airline passengers, how, you know, whatever. The stock quote of your favorite quote of some stock or some whatever. And I'm asking you to model it. How do you go about modeling data that you have observed? You want to create some, a model that captures the structure of this signal that you want to find that you can use to be able to predict what's going to happen or to predict if there was a change in the signal or something like that. And the way we envision it is that we are thinking of the data, y of t, as something that was generated by passing a white noise through a linear filter. So we are seeing this as the way the data was designed. Obviously, this is not going to be the case. You know, reality doesn't work that way. You have a white noise and you run it through a linear, a linear filter, creates, it creates temperature outside. But this is the model we're using. And what we are aiming to do now is we're trying to reconstruct, we're trying to find this model, this filter, took this white noise and created the signal. The way we do that is that we work backwards. We take uh, the data and then we run it through the inverse model and try to see if we can create something that is a white noise. The reason for that is that if it is a white noise, it doesn't contain any structure. There's nothing more that you can model in this data to make the model better. There's nothing you can extract that is not completely random if the sequence is, is a white noise. So we will be interested in trying to determine if something is a white noise or not. Is this a signal? Is it, is it Gaussian? Is it white? And it's going to be very important questions for us that, as, as we move ahead. But the principle is simple in the sense that we, what we're trying to do is that we try to first we build a very simple model, then we add to the model, making it more and more advanced such that we capture more and more of the structure of the signal until whatever is left that is not model is essentially or close to being a white noise and then we're happy. The way you go about it is that you create, uh, for, you take your data set and you create two big sets. First of all you take, take a large chunk of the data and create a modeling data set. This is the data that you use to create the model. Then you take a second data set, that's your validation data and this is when you want to check whether your model works. Is it good enough? And finally there's a chunk of data, which is the test data. This is where you evaluate how well uh, the, algorithm, the, the model worked as compared to other uh, models. Uh, can you use it? Can you not use it? Is it good enough? That is that data that determines that. So the first question is, of course, how much data should I pick for this modeling set? And that's a really hard question to answer. There's, that really depends. But basically what you want to do is you want to take a large chunk of the data and you would want the statistics of the data to appear to be stationary during this time. So what I mean by that is, is that say that for instance I have a, a, a sequence that looks like this and it's just growing and growing and growing and then it goes down again. right? So during this part of the data in the beginning the statistic is the same. You have something that is growing, there's some kind of periodicity or something noise-like, but then here it is changing and it goes down again. So for instance, say this is the outside temperature, you know, and this is the summer, so it goes up and it's summer and then, you would, and then, and then it becomes winter. You would want your model to be able to capture, of course, different seasons of the year, but you will, will not be able to easily capture this cycle by just looking at a small chunk of data like that. So what you want to do is you want to take a chunk which is reasonably large, um, but still has the same kind of structure to the data. It doesn't change, so your statistic is the same. That is your modeling data. Say 60%, say 70%, 80% of the data. Probably less than 80 Then you take your validation set. That is sort of the next chunk. That is a, a different part. You know, this is, this is slightly later in the set. It could be over here if you pick this as your as your uh, modeling data, your validation could be over here. That's perfectly fair. It is it is some other part of the data that you did not use to model the data. And what you want to use this data for is that you want to use your model and try to predict this data. And then what you want to do is you want to see that the only thing you cannot predict is this white noise, the residual. If your model is good, you can predict it that well. Of course, you can only predict one time step ahead without 
without getting structure into it. So what you're doing is that you 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 have your data, and this is this is the data you do not have. That's your validation data. Of course, you you know it, but when you try to make a prediction from here to the next sample, that's my prediction. You do not use the data here in the time point, but you compare to it, and you see, oh, okay, there's a small that's a small error. Then what you do is you say, oh, I have the data up to this point, and then you try to predict the next point, say this one, I get another sample. And then I say, oh, I have this one, I have this sample, and I compare the error, this is this one. And then what I get is something which is what we call the validation residual. This should be a white noise. It's a one-step prediction of your validation data, one step at a time. You move ahead, predict one sample ahead, then you pretend that you knew that sample and you predict one sample ahead and so forth. So you walk through your entire validation step, making a one-step prediction all the way through. The reason why you wanted to make it one step, we'll come back to why that is, but basically the reason is that then you can expect this residual to be a white noise. And then you want to compare, is it a white noise? And typically this is not going to be a white noise the first time. There will be some structure in it. Typically it will have something like this. You will see, okay, so there is a periodicity in there. I should be able to use that periodicity. I wasn't able to capture that with the model that I was building so you go back you prove your model and then you go and check again see if it works there is a risk of, of over modeling the data this way so you have to be very careful so that you do not make your model bigger and bigger and bigger essentially if you think of it as having the model being one parameter per sample you can make that residual zero that's not a good model you want your model to have as few parameters as possible but still being able to capture the structure of the signal so you will have this, ten, this problem of, of either want to improving the model but still reducing the dimensionality of the, of the model. And you will have to fight the two of those. Then after you did this and, and your residual is really what you deem white or you know reasonably white, you will come, we'll come back to this issue of reasonably white, meaning that yeah, it's not so perfect, but you know you can't really make it better than that. And typically the reason for this is that you know nobody will give you enough data for anything ever. So your validation data and your modeling data will always be much less than you would want it to be. And the, um, the amount of data re, uh, de clearly affects the quality of your model. So if you don't have enough data, the quality is not good enough. And of course, then the result is not good enough either. That is going to be the standard case. It's exceedingly rare that someone gives you enough data to make a perfect or you know, close to perfect model. So it's always going to be reasonably good. And that's when you stop. And when you stop, then you check when you test and, co and compute the uh, uh, the residual there, and the variance of this residual is the measure you use to determine how well did your model work on this data set as compared to any other uh, uh, model that was built on this data. So let's look at it step by step. So in the beginning, the first step is to say, is there, if I look at my data here, is there is there any is there any need to transform the data? And the re what you're looking for then is, say, if you remember the airline passenger data, it looked something like this. It was growing and growing and growing like this, right? So the variance of the data is not stable. The variability of the data changes over time. We do not want that to be. Uh, and what you typically do then is that you take a log transform of the data. You log, take the log of each sample. You can take square roots and other things like this. We'll come back to what you do and how you determine this uh, in chapter 4.5. Uh, sorry, 4.4. Um, but basically what you're looking for is if the uh, statistics is deemingly not stable, how can I stabilize it? And then the transformation is often the key. This can also be if the data is not very... Gaussian. You, you're looking at it and you make a, a test for Gaussianity and it's really, really not Gaussian. It can help you to transform the data to then make it more Gaussian. That is also going to be effect. So this is all one of the big reasons why you take a log of data is because it becomes more Gaussian that way. Obviously, you do not want to make a transform if you do not need it. So it's always like that. Do not add something you don't need. But beware of that it can be helping you if you have it in there. So this is the first step. The next thing you're looking for is does the data have trends? So that is, for instance, I have a periodicity growing along this line. This is a trend line. So I can see there is a linear trend growing in my data. I would want to remove that. Then what you do is you, you, know, you build something that can handle this trend, and then you remove the trend. This is done in chapter 4.3. Uh, if you, if after, after removing the trend, you would want your data to look something like that, right? So that there's no trend in your data anymore. After removing the transform, 
after after transforming the data, you had something that had a growing variability, and after that, you would want it to look something like that, so the, that the variability is stable. You're looking to remove complexity by these steps. So. Is there a trend is the question. We will have tests for that and try to determine it and remove it. But obviously, often you can sort of see it in the data right away by just eyeballing the data. The next thing, is there periodicity in the data? So here's my data, right? I have removed my trend. There is a clear season to the data. For instance, there's a 12-month cycle, there's a 24-hour cycle or whatever. Right? There is some kind of periodicity in my data, some structure that I want to remove. Uh, we will take care of that uh, again also in chapter 4.3 and what we are looking for is something that removes this so that you do not have this kind of structure in it and you would get something that is more random and, and appears uh, basically as a stochastic process, some realization of stochastic process. Then you're ready to move on to the next step and this step you try to build your model. You're asking yourself should I use an AR, should I use an MA, should I use an ARMA? Maybe a sum of sinusoids. Uh, what is a good model? Yeah, well, it depends on the problem, of course. So we will then try different models and try to figure out what is a good model. And checking, of course, uh, connecting with that is the issue of the model order. We need to determine what is the model order. We will use something called the Keike and, and uh, the Bayesian information criteria and so forth. This is done in chapter 5.3. Basically, you know, if you say it's an AR process, what is the model order of an AR? Should it be model 3? Should it be model 5? Should it be model 20? What is a good model and why should I pick it? That is the question you try to, to answer. So obviously the model selection and the model order selection are linked to each other. Should you pick an AR50 or should I pick an MA2? Or you know, What is a good choice? And in general here, there is one rule that you should keep always in mind, and that is what we call the KISS rule. And it's, the, it is a, it's an old acronym call, uh, f, uh, in, from NATO buildings, that, that is actually true, which means keep it simple, stupid. So... The idea here, or you can rename it Occam's Racer if you prefer that, is basically you want the smallest possible model uh, be that will make the data, the modeling robust, and it will allow you not to avoid overmodeling the data. So keep it simple. You want the simple, the smallest possible model that you can get away with. Yes, maybe improving it, adding it in from AR5 to AR50 did get you a slightly wider residual. It's not worth it. You would want it to be AR5 if you can have that, and it's still acceptable, because that will make it more uh, robust. So KISS rule, you should always remember. After that, say that we decided it is an AR. OK, so what are the parameters of this AR process? Say that we decided it was an AR10. That would be a typical model used, for instance, for modeling speech. How do I determine the coefficients in this AR process? Uh, the way you can do that there is, is, is you, have, you use, for instance, a least squares, a maximum likelihood, a prediction error method technique. We will discuss these later on uh, in Chapter 5.2 and determining both what is the appropriate uh, estimation algorithm to use and also how, how good is it I mean, and, and how good can it be. There are theoretical results here that are quite interesting, so allowing you to determine what is the best possible result you can achieve you know not meaning that this is you'll be happy but meaning that there's just you know that you, you can stop because it will never ever be better we will discuss this too and that basically gives us a bound of how well something can be predicted so say for instance we're looking to predict the ericsson stock quote and compute that this bound is 10 kroners plus minus that means that you know it is just not theoretically possible using that model to get a better estimate than that. So, of course, you can change the model. That way, maybe you can improve your prediction, or it is just not feasible. So this is going to be quite important for us to be able to tell how, how good can the results be, and when should you just stop. So we'll come back to that there. Uh, so then after you did that, you want to know, is your residual white? I mean, now you, you, you estimated, you said it was an AR10, you estimated the coefficient, you have removed all the trends and all the periodicities and so forth. And you are looking to see, if I filter using this model, will the residual be a white noise? And typically, the answer is no. So, uh, no. That is, that's going to be your normal situation. What you do then is that you go back, first of all, you go back and see, well, maybe it wasn't an AR5. Even though you were pretty convinced that it was an AR5, now you're saying, maybe it was an AR6 after all. 
your AR5, which is not good enough. So you go back, you say it's an AR6 now, you re-estimate the parameters, you check, is the model good enough? Then you do that over and over again, and you realize that you know you're you're looking at something that is an AR50 or something. It's just that's a huge model. You don't you know for your data that you're not finding it reasonable that you need that many parameters. So you say, oh, okay, maybe I should go back and change. Maybe I should use an ARMA model instead. So you go back up again and change it to an ARMA 2.3 model or something like that, and say, oh no no I don't I you know I, it really isn't an AR. It's an ARMA. And then you try again and you try to change the AR parts and the MA part and so forth, and you improve your model and see if you can make it better. You're always keeping track of the variance of your uh, residual. I mean, if you have a variance that goes down, obviously you could model more of the data. Your model becomes better and better. But again, you remember that if I just have enough parameters, one per sample, you can pick each parameter to be that uh, value of the data point and your residual will be zero. And variance zero, of course, two then two. And so obviously looking just at the variance is not going to help you very much. So you have to be able to compare the models of similar sizes. So it's a, say that it's an AR5 and, and an ARMA 2.3. Those both have five parameters. It's reasonable to make comparisons. In that case, by estimation rule, it's going to be preferable to pick the AR in general, if they are equally good or reasonably equally good, just because you can more accurately estimate the AR parameters. We'll come back to that when we talk about estimation theory, but there are going to be some models that are better in some sense. They are easier to estimate, they are, they are more reliable, they, they are more robust, so even though you know your ARMA model might be slightly better, it's not worth it in reality because it's not it's not as robust. For instance, so this is going to be a case that we want to do and want to check very careful. And then then you, of course you come to this question. So so this is if if that doesn't work, you go back and say maybe I should put the you know I should change my trend. If that didn't work, you go back and you know change your transform if you had one or add a transform or whatever. And then you just keep going. And finally you come to a point where you say well. I think it is white now, and and in chapter five point four in the book, we are looking at that and see can how can you deem if something is white? How can you test if something is white and get a statistically you know a result that says that yes, it is white statistically significantly, or not? And you know how how you go about it. Say that I got that now. I so I got my white residual. I'm happy about it. How you know should should how do I know if it's good? Is uh, am I happy? Is it good enough now? The answer is maybe. Because you need always to make a comparison to something what we call the naive uh, predictor. If you have a, mo you're comparing your data to something, you want to make a comparison to something that is completely naive. So say that I want to predict the temperature tomorrow. I build a model and I, I it's super advanced. And yes, it is does give me a white noise, but it is still you know give, giving me an estimate which is much much worse if I just pick the temperature today at the same time point. At 3 p.m. yesterday, it was you know 25 degrees, so I'll just assume it's going to be 25 degrees tomorrow at 3 p.m. That is what we have as a naive predictor. Your model needs to be better than that, otherwise there's not much point to it. right? How do you design your naive predictor? It really depends on the problem. So typically you either repeat the previous sample or you make it like a linear combination of a few samples, or you pick like the 3 p.m. last you know, yesterday, if you want to predict 3 p.m. today, and so forth like that. Basically, you want to make it as unintelligent as possible, but not entirely stupid. I mean, if you pick it, you know, temperature outside at midnight, and you're comparing it to 3 p.m. today, I mean, obviously, it's going to be a shitty uh, estimator. It's not going to give you anything reasonable. So you have to, you have to be fair to it. You when you design your naive predictor, you make it a fair predictor, but not very intelligent. It doesn't use much structure. Uh, uh, but you should be able to beat it. Otherwise, your model is just not good. It's not worthwhile. It's, you shouldn't do it. So, to summarize, we will use the modeling data to construct the model going through this step. So this is one. We go through all of these steps and we get something that we deem white. That was um, step one and two. We are having a model residual which is now reasonably white. Then what we do is we will take the next chunk of data. So this was the modeling data that I used. Now I move over to the validation data. I'll take my model, I use all the data up to this point, and I try to predict what is going to happen here. And I happen to know that because, you know, hey, I have that data. It's actually looking like this. So I'm trying to predict this value. And then I compare the difference between these two values, and I say, okay, that's this sample. Then I say, oh, no, 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 I actually had this sample. I'm trying to predict this sample instead. And compare it to that one, and then I will get this, what we call the uh, validation residual, 
Uh, and this is something we also want to be white. And if it is not white, what do we do then? Well, when, then we go back and say, should I change my model order? Should I change my, uh, the structure of my model? And so forth. And you iterate on your model and try to improve it. And then when you're happy, you say, fine, I have something that works and I'm, you know, my model is great and so forth. If it's not good enough, then what do you do? Well, maybe it is such that it's, you know, you just cannot deal with it as simple as that. Maybe I need some other input. Say that I'm trying to model the temperature outside, but I do know the wind speed. So I know the wind speed and I can predict it very accurately. Can I use the wind speed to improve my model of the temperature? And so the way you do that is that you create two models. One that is the wind speed, and then you create a model for the wind speed and you say, well, that wind speed model will capture most of the structure. Then you have your uh, stochastic model, say your armor model or whatever, that's model A. That is, you're trying to use that to 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 estimate the part that you uh, that you couldn't model with model B. So you get a concatenation of two models. Say that, for instance, you have uh, the the stock quote of Google and you want to predict the stock quote of, of Facebook. There is a dependency between those two. So if one goes up, the other one will likely go up too. So you want to exploit. Uh, the information you have in one time series to use that to improve your model uh, in your other uh, data sets. This is something we'll talk about in chapter 4.5 and also in chapter 7, trying to exploit dependencies in the data. There's nothing that prevents that you have more than one input. So say that you try to predict the stock quote of Google and you happen to have Microsoft and Facebook and, or you can predict them, well, maybe you have inside information what's going on there. Can you build a model that exploits that? Yes, you can. What you do then is that you look at your data, that would be my Facebook data, right? And I'm trying to see which is, has the strongest dependency. Okay, so Microsoft had the strongest dependency. Then I will first build a model for the Microsoft part. I'll remove that part. Uh, anything that I can model with the Microsoft data, I will remove, and then I will have something left. And I'll say, okay, it wasn't as strong to this Google data or something. And I'll try to build a model that exploits that and look at what I have left. This is what I have left. And I'll try then to build a stochastic model using that. Those would be the typical cases. And this way you can have many, 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 right? You can have you know tons and tons of them. Typically, after a few, this is getting very, very difficult. So what you do then is then you do multivariate models where you have many inputs and many outputs. And we'll talk about that later too. And then, of course, what if this is not good enough? Well, it doesn't mean that, you know, if I have this kind of data set, maybe your linear model is just not good enough. So say that I'm looking at the temperature outside. Obviously, it goes up, and then it's summer, and then it goes down. How should I be able to use this kind of small chunk of data to try to predict the temperature in the fall? That's going to be very difficult, because what I see, the only part I see in my modeling data is something that is a growing trend. Uh, so I will have to assume that this growing trend is going to keep going because that's the only reasonable assumption given the data that I'm observing in my modeling data set. So what you want to do then is you want to make an adaptive model such that the model changes over time. Basically, I will say that it's, for instance, an AR10, but then I will let the coefficients in my AR10 change over time. So we'll discuss this part in Chapter 8 at the very end of the course. But by then, you will know it all and be ready for the real world.